Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining class. We'll uh, begin with a word of prayer. So can I ask uh, Siddhikenu, can you please lead us in prayer, please? Yes, ma'am. Father, we come to the throne of great Lord, grace, Lord. Thank you for this day you have given us, Lord. We thank you for each and every good work that you have done in your life, Lord. As you are going to learn from your word, Lord, each and every word, Lord, should be, Lord, we will be understanding, Lord. Lord, we need your wisdom, we need your understanding, Lord. So that we can do your ministry work, Lord, with more effectiveness, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so last Friday we were looking at uh, the lesson on uh, the doctrine of uh, uh, Christ. And we, were look we looked at his humanity. Uh, and then we came up to the deity of Christ. And... Um, uh, in the deity of Christ, we've all uh, we already had studied quite a bit about this in um, in uh, Christology. So we kind of looked at uh, a few points. We kind of uh, reviewed a few points on the deity of Christ that we had uh, uh, had studied in Christology, and then we looked at. Um, uh, the notes that were given in uh, doctrinal foundation systematic theology. We looked at the scriptural proofs for the deity of Christ, um, and we said that's very extensive in the New Testament. And we basically are going to look at um, the names of God um, and how it's attributed to uh, Christ, and hence proving uh, that uh, Jesus Christ is God. Uh, but we looked at more aspects about his deity when we studied in systematic theology, and we kind of reviewed that in the previous two classes. Uh, so we looked at the first name of God, which is Theos, uh, and um, oh, which is an, uh, a name that is used for... Uh, um, for God himself uh, in the Old Testament, uh, which is the uh, Theos is the equivalent of uh, the name of God, uh, Elohim. Uh, and we know that Elohim, we uh, read this uh, name Elohim mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, uh, where we see that uh, God is the source of all creation and he is a powerful God. Uh, and we read this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So uh, we see this name Elohim here and the Greek equivalent of Elohim. We know that the uh, New Testament is written in Greek. So the Greek word for this or the Greek equivalent of the name Elohim is Theos. And we read this in John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was uh, the Logos and the Logos was with Theos and the Logos was Theos. So the beginning was the word, the word was with God. So the word God there, if you look at it in the Hebrew word, it's Elohim. But if you read it here, it is in the Greek equivalent, it's Theos. And so the name Elohim, which is used exclusively for God in the Old Testament, uh, is referred to for Jesus in the New Testament with the word Theos, which is the equivalent of uh, the Greek equivalent of the name Elohim. Um, uh, Elohim, which is used only for God. And we also saw the references where this word uh, Theos, which is used uh, for God himself, is ascribed to Jesus. And hence we see that uh, Jesus, or we can prove that Jesus is deity, that he is God. Uh, the second name of God we saw was the name uh, Kyrios or Kurios. Uh, so does anyone remember what is the equivalent uh, name of kurios in the Old Testament? Kurios is the Greek word for the equivalent of which name of God in the Old Testament? Anyone remembers? No? So kurios is the, the Greek word for the, uh, the name of God, Adonai. Okay, and what does Adonai mean? What does Adonai mean? Any answers? You can type your answers in the chat section. What does Adonai mean? Uh, 
it means a lord or master, uh, a sovereign, somebody who's sovereign, somebody who's a lord. And so we know that this, uh, the Hebrew word Adonai, which means lord or sovereign, is used um, uh, for earthly masters, those who are owners, uh, those who are in authoritative places. Uh, and it's also used for God. Okay, as one who is supreme, as one who is sovereign. So the equivalent, the Greek equivalent for this name Adonai is uh, kurios, okay, or kyrios. And we see um, uh, this word is um, uh, used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, also, if uh, you know, if you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, or it's the Greek version of the uh, of the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament is written in uh, Hebrew, but if you, for those who are, uh, you know, the Greek-speaking audience, uh, they had translated the whole of the Old Testament in uh, Greek, and so it was. It's called the Septuagint, and wherever we see this word. Uh, uh, Kyrios, which means Adonai or Lord, uh, is uh, you know the 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 Greek speaking Jews or uh, the Greek speaking uh, uh, readers uh, who read the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament in Greek. Wherever they saw this word Kyrios, they would know that it referred to uh, Yahweh, um, and they recognized it as uh, as the name. Uh, which meant Lord, but one who was the creator and the sustainer of heaven and earth, the omnipotent God, okay? So the word Kyrios was very familiar with the, the Greek-speaking uh, uh, readers who read the Old and New Testament, and wherever they saw this word Kyrios or Kurios, they knew it was the word that was uh, attributed to Adonai, and hence they would see it not just like uh, an earthly master, uh, or an owner, but somebody who, uh, who is a God, who is the creator, the sustainer of heaven and earth, and who is the omnipotent uh, uh, God. So there are uh, various instances in the New Testament where this name uh, Lord is used, uh, and wherever it's used, it's referred to Jesus Christ. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, Jesus uh, is also known as God because he's attributed the same name uh, for Yahweh, uh, which means Adonai, Kurios, Lord. And uh, so people knew that uh, Jesus was also not just somebody who was uh, man, but he was also deity. He was also God uh, because of this word that was attributed to Jesus Christ. So we see it in several places, but we will just look at it in... Um, uh, we look at three um, or two references. One is in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. So can one of you please read Luke chapter 2, verse 11? And someone else can read Luke chapter 1, verse 43. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. And um, someone else can read Luke chapter 1, verse 43, please. Luke chapter 2, verses 11. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Thank you. So here it's referring to Jesus, who is, uh, you know, who is Christ the Lord. And so the word Lord here is kurios, but it does not mean somebody who's a master or an owner. Uh, it does not mean the general term of the use Adonai, but it is the name that is referred exclusively to God, uh, God of the Old Testament, God the Father. And hence, we see that the same name is ascribed to Jesus Christ, hence proving that he is deity, that he is God. Another reference is Luke chapter 1, verse 43. Can somebody read that, please? Forty-three. But why am I so favored? That the, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Okay, so uh, who's saying this? Who's making the statement? Why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? John the Baptist mother, I think. 
Yes, uh, it's talking about Elizabeth. Uh, and in what context is Elizabeth saying this? Any idea what context is Elizabeth saying this? We see Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, you know, who's coming to meet Elizabeth. Uh, but this is just before uh, the angel meets her, says that she will conceive uh, to the power of the Holy Spirit and will give forth uh, a, 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 a son will be born to her and she's to name him Jesus. Uh, so this is uh, just after that she comes to meet Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, when she sees Mary, uh, it is through the... Uh, you know, to the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, she says, why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So when she says, my Lord, uh, what is she really meaning here? What is she meaning here when she says, my Lord? Is he, she's she's saying that uh, you know uh, this is uh, uh, you know someone like um, uh, Lord means is she does is is she meaning uh, a master like a human master or somebody who's an owner? Is she meaning that? Hello, class. Is anyone there? No. No responses. Okay, uh, here when you know when you read this verse, it's not uh, the word "curios" does not mean that she's talking about some earthly human master, but what she's uh, basically saying here is, uh, you know, why why is it granted to me that the mother of the Lord God Himself should come to me? So you know, the word here "curios" is not just meaning some earthly master or an owner because uh, Jesus is not yet born and he can't be Elizabeth's earthly master or owner and uh, she's not under him. But when she was using this word, she was using it in the sense that, you know, uh, that uh, the mother of the Lord God himself uh, should come to me. So the word curios here is talking about uh, God, uh, referring to God, God of the Old Testament in the same name is ascribed here to Jesus as well, hence proving that um, uh, he is a deity. Another reference that we can read uh, where we find this word kurios, which is referring to Jesus Christ and referring to him as deity, as God, is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. Can one of you read that, please? Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 3. This is he who was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight path for him. Thank you. So we see another example here when Matthew... Uh, says that John the Bap <clears throat> sorry, John the Baptist is the one who cries out in the wilderness and uh, he cries out saying, prepare the way of the Lord. The word Lord here is not just somebody who is an earthly master or ruler, but it's, uh, it's referring to God, uh, referring to the uh, God the Father who is God himself. And hence, when it's the same word, kurios here uh, is ascribed to um uh, to uh, Jesus, it's he's referred here to as God, who is deity. Uh, and so uh, John the Baptist, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, prepare the way of the Lord God who makes his path straight. And so here, through these references, uh, we see that the name or the title, Kurios, uh, which is a title referred to as uh, 
to God himself, the God of the Old Testament. Uh, uh, in the Hebrew word, it's Adonai, uh, but in the Greek, it's Kurios. And wherever this word Kurios is uh, mentioned in the New Testament, it is referring to uh, God the Father, who is God himself. And there are certain places where this word uh, or this term, this name is referred to Jesus Christ. And hence, it proves that Jesus Christ is deity. Okay, that he is God himself. And uh, Jesus himself claimed to be deity when he said uh, in uh, John chapter 8, verse 58. Can one of you read that, please? We already looked at this verse um, a couple of times in Christology and also in, uh, in doctoral foundations. John chapter 8, verse 58. Can anyone read John chapter 8, verse 58? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Thank you. So here, uh, Jesus is uh, referring himself uh, to as the, uh, with the title, I am. And uh, we saw this title, I am, it's referred to uh, 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 to God in the Old Testament, how God introduces himself. He says, I am who I am. And what is the meaning of the word I am or the term I am? You had this for your assessment as well. What is the meaning of the uh, name or the term I am? Anita, what is the meaning of this word I am? Anyone can answer what is the meaning of the word I am? You had this for your uh, assessment. I am means with after me, there is no. Okay, thank you, success. There's no one else like God, that's what you mean. I am mean somebody who is self-sufficient, uh, self-existent, uh, eternal, uh, someone who does not depend on anything else for his existence, who's self-existent and self-sufficient. Okay, the eternal God. So that is the meaning of the word I am. Okay, so we looked at uh, in this chapter the doctrine of uh, Christ. Now we look at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, I'm sure you've already gone through uh, the course on uh, Holy Spirit, right? In your uh, first uh, semester. Is that right? You studied about the Holy Spirit in the first semester? Yes, okay. Okay, so uh, most of it, what we will be going through will be uh, repetitive. So I would like all of you to uh, uh, to answer, okay, and uh, to make the class more engaging because this is something that you'd already studied about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. You had a full course, you were taught on uh, the Holy Spirit, okay? So who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Ma'am, according to me and according to my learning, Holy Spirit is the comforter. Like when Jesus was going up to the heaven to his ascending to his father, he told, I will be I will be going up, but I will not leave you alone. I will I will give you a suitable comforter who will be with you forever. So Holy Spirit is that comforter and supporter. Thank you, Siddhikenu. So, Holy Spirit is a comforter. That is one of the uh, characteristics, or we can say the attributes of uh, the Holy Spirit. But if we have to answer the question, who really is the Holy Spirit? Uh, uh, okay, Nicholson says, Holy Spirit is a third person in the Trinity. Okay, thank you. He's a comforter, he's a helper. Okay, that is what he does. Okay, uh, Lubega, yes. 
<clears throat> the Holy Spirit is the third person in in the Trinity who is co equal to the Father and uh, and the Son, and at the same time is the one who administers the will of God after he implements the will of God after after God had plans and uh, administered and Jesus Christ administers that will. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So he's a third person in the Trinity means what? When we talk about, when we say who is Jesus Christ, what would you say? He is a savior, but he would say he is God, right? So the most important thing about uh uh, the Holy Spirit is that he is God. Yes, he's a third person in the Trinity, but uh, the important thing for us to acknowledge is he is God. Uh, why is it important for us to acknowledge that Holy Spirit is God? Why is it important for us to acknowledge that Holy Spirit is God? Yes, Anita. Ma'am, he has the same attributes of God and his deity. He has the same attributes of God and his deity. Okay, thank you. It's important for us to make known that the Holy Spirit is God because many of them think that he is just a force of God or he is the power of God uh, or he's someone who just does things uh, for God, but he is not God himself uh, because of his the name, uh, you know, uh, 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 Numa, okay, uh, uh, which in the Greek is referring to the Holy Spirit, uh, which also in other places is the same word is ascribed to wind. So uh, people think that Holy Spirit is just some wind, some force, a fire, or uh, the power of God. Uh, but for us to acknowledge that Holy Spirit is God is very, very important. Uh, many of them uh, look at God the Father uh, you know, and God, uh, Jesus Christ as God the Son. But to acknowledge that Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit is God is very um, difficult for them because they think that Holy Spirit is just some the ghost or, you know, Holy Ghost or he is some power he is, or he is some... Uh, 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 you know, he's someone who just does the will of God. But uh, to acknowledge that Holy Spirit is God himself is very, very important. And yes, he's the third person of the Trinity. So when we say that Holy Spirit is God, uh, like Anita said, he has, uh, uh, he has the nature of God. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the nature of God, what is the nature of God? Or what is in essence we can say is uh, the the nature of God. I'm not talking about his attributes uh, that he's loving, kind. But when we talk about uh, you know God, uh, the essence or what he possesses uh, or that makes him God, what are those things that uh, make God God? Or what is the nature of God? Yes, Anita. Ma'am, he is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Okay, thank you. Uh, so when we talk about uh, you know uh, God being God in His substance or in essence, we are saying that He is omnipotent, uh, He is omnipresent, He is omniscient, He is eternal. Uh, and he is uh, sovereign. Okay, so these are uh, the attributes or so-called nature uh, that makes God who he is, that he is omnipresent, he is omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, and uh, sovereign. So if we say that the Holy Spirit is God, uh, you know, he has, to, we have to prove that he is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, and sovereign. Uh, and um, and so uh, we look at those uh, that you've already studied, that he is omnipresent. Where do we find in scripture that the uh, Holy Spirit is omnipresent? Okay. 
Psalms chapter 139, uh, verse 7. Uh, can one of you read that, please? Psalms chapter 139, verse 7. Can someone read one Psalms chapter 139, verse 7, please? Psalms chapter 139 and verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Thank you. So, uh, you know, it says wherever uh, we go in, if you look at uh, Psalm 139, if all of you can please turn to Psalm 139, verse 7, it says, you know, uh, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, even there you are there. Even if I dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your right hand will hold me. So it's talking about the Holy Spirit here. And the Spirit of God is present everywhere. And hence we see that he's omnipresent. And hence we can prove that he is God. He is all powerful. Uh, Luke chapter 1 verse 35. Can one of you read that please? Luke chapter 1 verse 35. Luke 135, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Thank you. So here we see that uh, it is through the power of the Holy Spirit uh, that uh, uh, Mary was able to conceive and she will give forth uh, 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 a, a son will be born to her and he will be called the son of uh, God. So we see that uh, the Holy Spirit is all powerful. Uh, we also read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 and 11. Can one of you please uh, read that? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 and 11 that the Holy Spirit is all knowing. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. But God has revealed, it is to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For, for who among men knows the thoughts of man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Thank you. So we see that the Holy Spirit reveals the things of God to us. He knows everything and he reveals it um, uh, to us. Okay. And we also know that the Holy Spirit is God because he is referred to or mentioned to as God uh, in Acts chapter 5, uh, where we read this incident about Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, when Peter, you know, in Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and verse 4, Peter said to Ananias, you know, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and you kept back a prize of the land for yourself? Uh, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? And why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have lied, you have not lied to men, but to God. So here in verse 3, he says that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And um, you in verse 4, he says you have lied not to men, but to God, hence ascribing Holy Spirit as uh, God. And we know that, uh, you know, uh, all of the books of the Bible were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it was written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so here we see that Holy Spirit is uh, attributed or is ascribed to as God. So if uh, if anyone asks you, how can you prove that the Holy Spirit is God? You can uh, show them these references in Psalm 139 verse 7, Luke chapter 1 verse 35, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10 and 11, talking about the uh, Holy Spirit is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and he's also God, uh, Acts chapter 5 verses 3 and 4. Uh, we see that he is also eternal. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. So we see that the eternal spirit here, uh, the spirit here uh, is not a small s, wherever there's a small s is referring to human spirit, but wherever there is a capital S, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. And so we see the eternal spirit 
uh, hence we know that the Holy Spirit is God because God is eternal. Uh, he is also sovereign because God is sovereign. If the Holy Spirit is God, he has to be sovereign. First uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6 and 11. The uh, First Corinthians chapter 12 is a chapter that's talking about the gifts of the Spirit and um, and it mentions in verse 6 and 11 that there are diversity of activities, but the same God who works all in all, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So the Holy Spirit uh, gives, um, uh, you know, which Give to the spirit that we need to use at what time, at what occasion, uh, when we are ministering to people, this, the Holy Spirit will determine which is the right gifts to be manifested at time and he will manifest it in and through us and uh, just as he wills. So we know that uh, God is sovereign. He does what he wills. We, we uh, learned about this in chapter one, where we talked about um, uh, uh, chapter two, the nature of God, that he is sovereign. He does what he wills. And here also we see that the Holy Spirit being God is sovereign. He does what he wills. We also see that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with uh, God the Father, and uh, God the uh, Son, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Uh, can one of you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, please? And someone else can read Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Okay, can one of you read uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2? Genesis chapter 1, verses 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Thank you. So the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So what does it, uh, uh, it show us? Or what does it teach us? Regarding the deity of the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit is God. What does it, it teach us? Remember, we tried to prove the deity of Christ and we looked at uh, uh, this verses and we proved the deity of Christ. So how can we prove that Holy Spirit is God through this verse? It was part of the process of creation. Thank you, uh, Paul, that Holy Spirit was the part of creation. That means he was in the very beginning uh, he was even before time began, and he was the one who brought about um, uh, creation, uh, and he is was with the Father and with the Son in the whole creation process. Thank you. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Can one of you read that, please? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Isaiah 11, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 2. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So here is, uh, uh, who is it talking about? The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Who is the him here? Ma'am Jesus. Yes, thank you. It's talking about Jesus. It's a capital H, so it's not talking about any human being, but it's talking about God. It's talking about Jesus. So we see that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with the Father and Son. He was there with them in creation. He was also there even before Jesus became incarnate. And it was through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was able to teach, preach, uh, do signs, miracles, and wonders. And it is also through the power of the Holy Spirit that uh, he was able to, that uh, Jesus Christ was raised back 
back from death to uh, life. So here we see that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with the Father and Son. So these are very important points uh, because there are many people who do not believe that the Holy Spirit is God. So for us to prove that the Holy Spirit is God, uh, these uh, you know references and these points are very, very important. We also see that in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is not um, referred to as a thing. Uh, when we talk about a thing, we refer to as an it, okay? Uh, but he's referred to as a person. So wherever we read about the Holy Spirit, John chapter 14, John chapter 16, uh, we see that he's referred to as he, him, uh, uh, and it's he's not referred to as it. And so we know that Holy Spirit is not a, just a power or force or a, uh, you know, some fire or, uh, uh, you know, uh, water, but he is uh, God. He has a personality. He uh, uh, reveals himself to us as a person, just like God the Father reveals himself to us as a person, just like God uh, uh, the Son reveals himself to us as a person. So the Holy Spirit is not some force or some influence but he's rather an individual who has all the attributes, uh, the qualities of a person, and he, uh, you know, ministers to us as a person, okay? So uh, what is the basic role of the Holy Spirit? I'm sure you studied about this in, uh, uh, in your course on the Holy Spirit. So what is the role or what is the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives? Ma'am, in our life, Holy Spirit is working as a guide. Like, if we are about to do something wrong, it is it will be saying from our conscience, like, don't do this. Like, Father will not allow this. It is not for your Christianity life. It is basically a guide. Okay, thank you. He's a guide. Yes, Lubega? Uh, I think it is in the same sense because when the Christ was about to go, he promised that uh, the the spirit of truth, the guide, the reminder will be with us. So in, in other words, it's like the Holy Spirit convicts us, tells us that this and this and that. So I think in the same spirit, I can say like my brother Siddhikano, there is a guider. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. The Holy Spirit is a guide. Okay. Other than a guide, what else is he? Holy Spirit is our teacher. Okay, thank you. Holy Spirit is our teacher. Anything else? So we see in um, in John chapter 14, uh, verse uh, 26, Jesus says, uh, the Holy Spirit is your helper. Uh, he will teach you all things. He will remind you of everything that Jesus has spoken to you. Uh, we also see in, um, in John chapter 16, where, um, you know, um, uh, it talks about the Holy Spirit there. Also, it's uh, referred to, He's referred to as somebody who will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on authority, but he will only hear. Um, he will on, He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit will tell you things that are to come. He will reveal uh, things of God. Um, uh, the Holy Spirit will also, uh, you know, take the things that are from the Father. He will declare it to us. He will make it known to us. Uh, we also see that the Holy Spirit is someone, uh, you know, who convicts um, a person of sin, uh, righteousness, and and judgment. So the Holy Spirit uh, convicts a sinner of sin, righteousness, and ju uh, and uh, and uh, uh, judgment. Holy Spirit is also somebody who empowers us uh, to do mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. Holy Spirit is the one who gives, uh, you know, who reveals the truth in God's word. That means He brings, makes note. 
the revelations he manifests to us he makes it known to us uh, he teaches us the things of god he teaches us the truth in the in god's word the holy spirit is the one who um, helps us to bear fruit uh, and activates the fruits of the spirit fruit of the spirit in our lives he's the one who helps us to bear the fruit he's also one who is our comforter here he, um, uh, he's uh, he's someone who would uh, also uh, uh, manifest the gifts of the spirit uh, uh, when we need it he's somebody who assures us of our salvation um, uh, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit so he's someone who assures us he test he helps us to testify about Jesus when we are persecuted he's the one who uh, stands alongside of us uh, who helps us to overcome um, persecutions he helps us to overcome uh, temptations he's a parakletos that means parakletos the greek word the greek name for holy spirit uh, someone who comes alongside us to aid us to support us to help us um, so there's so many uh, uh, aspects of the holy spirit the holy spirit also uh, refreshes us in our inner man he renews us he strengthens us uh, he builds us he gives us the assurance that we are uh, uh, the sons and daughters of uh, Jesus Christ he helps us uh, he works in a sinner to have them to be born again he's the one who helps us to live a sanctified life he uh, you know the, the whole process of sanctification helping us to live a holy life uh, is the work of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit gives us knowledge of the things that God has prepared for us uh, you know, uh, uh, like it says in First Corinthians chapter two, verse nineteen and sixteen: No eye has seen, no ear has heard, uh, no human mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. But these things are revealed to us by the uh, Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals not only the truth in God's word. Uh, revelations helps us to understand. Uh, God's word, but the Holy Spirit is somebody who also reveals the mind of God to us, reveals the will of God to us. He reveals the plan of uh, God to us. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us all things about God. He is also somebody who helps us to pray right romans chapter 8 verse 26 and 27 uh or the, we do not know what to pray but the holy spirit helps us to pray in our weaknesses he intercedes on behalf of us um uh, you know, he uh, uh, reveals the heart and the mind of God to us. Uh, it's because the Holy Spirit that we can have access to the Father. Uh, the Holy Spirit also uh, enables us um, uh, to continue running our race with perseverance, helping us to fulfill the plans and purposes God has for us. Uh, he uh, enables us to hold on to the things that have been committed to us. Uh, he, uh, you know, uh, enables us to overcome persecution. He also, you know, um, releases the gifts of the Spirit. And when we are uh, flowing the supernatural, it's the Holy Spirit manifesting in and through our lives. So if you see, there is uh, the the work of the Holy Spirit is so extensive, is so vast. Uh, there's so many areas that the Holy Spirit uh, works um in and through our lives okay so we just look at uh, a few of the works of the holy spirit um, so we look at the holy spirit in uh, the life of a sinner um, the holy spirit convicts um, uh, the world of sin uh, uh, we read this in acts chapter 2 verse 37 and 39 the holy spirit also convicts the world of uh, christ's righteousness uh, that means it uh, tells, shows the people of the world that our righteousness is not good enough before God. So the Holy Spirit helps people who are sinners to see themselves in relation uh, with God who is holy, who is upright, and that uh, they have fallen short of uh, God's righteous standard. Uh, so when, it, when uh, the word is being preached, the Holy Spirit works in a sinner's life, showing them uh, their relationship in terms uh, with a righteous God who is Jesus, uh, Jesus who uh, in his righteousness is perfectly holy and that we are utterly uh, sinful 
uh, and uh, even though Jesus was human, he lived a sinless life. And, uh, you know, in the light of this uh, causes uh, a sinner to repent and accept Jesus. The Holy Spirit also convicts the world of judgment. Uh, uh, it shows people that there is consequences for their sinful actions. And that's why we see, uh, you know, everyone, whether it's believers or unbelievers, you know, uh, they go to different places, they offer God uh, sacrifices, uh, so that, you know, their sin can be covered, atoned, and they don't receive the wrath of God. And so people know in any faith, they know that there is consequences for the wrong actions that they're doing. Um, so the Holy Spirit makes known to them that, uh, you know, that the, their consequences not only has uh, consequences here in this life, but also uh, there's eternal uh, everlasting punishment for those who turn their backs on Jesus Christ. And, um, uh, and we see that man on his own will never be convinced that he deserves judgment, but it's the only the Holy Spirit who convicts a sinner uh, of their sin, uh, of the punishment that they're going to receive and will lead them into um, repentance, okay? Um, and the uh, Holy Spirit also helps a person see that, uh, you know, it is uh, them who deserves the punishment for their sins. The punishment for sin, it is, is death. They are guilty, but uh, will help them to understand that, uh, you know, Jesus Christ has taken their place, has died on the cross for their sins and helps, uh, the whole, uh, helps a sinner to see um, how loving God is, how God has taken their place and helps uh, the sinner repent and uh, shows them this, that they, they need a savior and helps them to turn to uh, God. We also see that the Holy Spirit testifies about um, uh, Jesus. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 15, uh, verse 26. If you look at John chapter 15, verse 26, um, Jesus says, but when the helper comes, the helper here is talking about the Holy Spirit. And if you uh, see, it's a capital H, uh, so it's referring to God. Uh, it's not a small H referring to man. So the helper comes talking about the Holy Spirit, he uh, whom I sent to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. That means the Holy Spirit will testify that Jesus is God. Uh, he will testify of everything that Jesus has done, has said. Uh, uh, the truth in God's word, he will testify to you is the truth. It's what God has done and will testify about Jesus himself. Okay, uh, and we also read an instance uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, where uh, the apostles were put in jail. This is after Jesus uh, was, died and he ascended back to the Father. The whole the apostles or the disciples were um, doing mighty signs and miracles, and they were all put into the jail. And during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the doors um, of, the, uh, uh, of the jail, and they were set free. And the Holy Spirit tells them, uh, you know, uh, to go and uh, to testify, to witness about uh, these things. So the, you know, at daybreak, they go to the temple courts and they began teaching the people. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, they are, they are uh, commissioned by God uh, to uh, testify of what uh, has happened. So they say that, you know, we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So when they are brought before the uh, chief priests and the scribes and the teachers of the law, they say, you know, we told you not to do it, but why are you preaching and teaching in, in Jesus' name? They say that we cannot stop because we are witnesses of the things that we have seen. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Okay. And, um, we see that uh, we read in First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse three, that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So the, the Holy Spirit that uses the Word of God to convict a sinner of their sin and lead them to repentance and lead them to accepting uh, Christ as their personal Savior. Okay, so we look at more of the works of the Holy Spirit uh, in our next class on Friday. We'll stop here. Uh, any of you have any questions? Any doubts?
Okay, if there's no questions, no doubts, we'll uh, end class here and I'll see you on, um, on um, Friday. I've corrected your assessments and I hope all of you have received your uh, marks. Yes? Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay.